Hey, welcome to Office Hours. This is a 30-minute webinar to help you successfully achieve SIP certified. From December through May, we'll host six of these webinars to touch all 14 of the standard chapters. And SIP certified staff and experts will be online to answer your questions. Some general tips for completing your application this year. Do your requirements first, since these are often the more difficult questions and you must achieve them to get certified. When you answer management enhancements, answer the ones that you can and keep a running list of the ones that you can achieve later so you can revisit them. And we also recommend using the photos list. It's a list of all the standards questions that require photos. Take this with you when you go around your property so you know which photos to take for your application. And the link is in the chat, it's the very top one. And for those of you who are new to the database, we'll show you what it looks like and what the different icons mean. Let me get my share over. Okay, so this icon here, it's a little leaf. It means that this is a question that applies to vineyards. The tank here means it's a question that applies to wineries. This calendar means that it is a uh, question that requires a date box answer. And then here, this double arrow means that it's a management, uh, management group question. So if you have multiple properties, you can create a management group and answer all the questions at the same time. And then the last icon right here, it's the handshake icon. And that means that as well as answering this question on the online portal, you will also go over it with your inspector when they visit you for the online inspection. Cancel that. All right. So each office hours webinar focuses on two to three chapters, and then we'll have time for questions and answers at the end. We'll call out the standards by number so you know which questions that we're talking about. And while each webinar focuses on specific chapters, feel free to bring any questions that you have. Just be sure to refer to them by their standard number, for example, 5.4.1, so that we can pull it up and read it along with you. And if it's your first time getting SIP certified, know that the first year generally takes 60 to 80 hours to complete the documentation. Once you're certified, you can expect to invest just 20 hours per year. <laughs> That's a lot, huh? <laughs> but we're here with you. You're not alone. So if you have questions along the way or need a little more support, just reach out and we got your back. All right. So this second office hours webinar will, chapter, will cover chapters 9, pest management, and 11, social equity. And we're joined today by Greg Hibbett. He's with Grapevine Capital, Inc., and he was on the committee when the SIP certifieds were originally written back in 04, you guys said? Yeah, we're or thinking of four. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Greg, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Okay, so yes, today are, we are doing chapters 9 and 11. So, Greg, let's start with 9. Uh, what can you tell us about the requirements in this chapter? So, I started by, you know, I spent a long time actually doing these certifications, and I have to admit it's been a long time since I've done that sort of thing. So I started by reading the intro and at the end of the day, I thought, you know, the intro is actually timed really, has, has aged really well, depending on whether it's been updated since we first did the standards. I thought, I thought it was still quite good. When I got into the requirements, you know, the thing that jumped out at me is the, <clears throat> is the prohibitive material list, mm -hmm. which was a big thing that we discussed for a long time when we were writing the document. And the thing that it, it it made me think about today looking at it was, you know, we we, we ended with a, a list of things where you could reference and determine our PML based on presence or not presence on that list. And it made me think about a debate that's going on right now around Roundup, because we had, you know, we wanted the groundwater stuff. We wanted clinorase inhibiting. We wanted the, the state list and the federal list you get into these very vague areas on, on something like that, the debate that's going on. So it just made me think that I think we had a methodology that still works when we did that PML. It's something we're going to have to kind of revisit at these, as these individual um, products or chemicals get discussed. So that, that was kind of what jumped out at me when I was going through it. And then as I was going through the management enhancements, I, I remember, you know, that, that one of the things we emphasized was, ongoing, there, there's a question on there that talks about having to look at your weeds um, and do a kind of a report on weeds every month and a few other things. And we had uh, PCAs who spent a lot of their time in the field during the growing season. And it, it made me remember that the, the key to that was that it forced us to really document that we were doing it year round and more importantly, actually do it year round. So I think when you have people that are new I think they're probably going to look at that and say, you know what, I spent a lot of time on this stuff during the growing season, but I have to actually now do it in season or out of season kind of in the dormant period. So I think that was a really important thing that kind of reminded me. So those are probably the three things that, you know, I thought about as I was going through that chapter. 
And I know with the pest scouting, it's one of the requirements. Um, that is really good feedback about that, you know, have people maybe changing their practices a little bit to comply with the standards. But that's also a positive feedback that we get from a lot of our participants is that it helps them with that consistency, you know, because they're going through this process each year. It's kind of that little reminder of like, oh, yeah, I do want to make sure, you know, I take care of this practice. That's going to be beneficial. Yeah. And I remember I remember we didn't have we we had the, the PCA reports, but really it, it died out in the wintertime. And so we had to come up with some reporting that showed that we were doing that. And and like I'm saying, it was it was almost as important that we did the documentation as realized that we had a hole in that part of the season that we weren't doing it. And it was meaningful to change that because if you're if you're making good decisions during the the dormant season, they really do translate through to the growing season. So it kind of it plugged a hole in a way that I don't even think we knew we had. Yeah. And with that prohibited materials list, a note for our members, you can download that independently and Whitney can include that in links for, mm -hmm. for a follow-up for this too. And make sure that anybody that's making spray decisions has that. So you want to make sure that earlier on, you know, in the, in the program of getting certified, because it runs from December 1st through November 30th, that you aren't using any of those materials on the list. Okay, and then let's see, what other requirements are in here? Um, a lot about the knowledge of diseases and pests and all that. Um, is it good to I don't, designate like one person to do this or like the whole team? How, is, how, is, how are these requirements really handled? When, when I was doing it, I was a part of a bigger company. So we would really kind of tag team the effort, have certain people working on certain things and others others. I, I can't speak to how, you know, a, a smaller group might do it. But in our case, we would have, you know, our members of the HR department work on the social equity section that, that would cover the entire company. And then as you were certifying individual vineyards, you know, certain people would work on certain parts of it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how that looks for everybody these days, but that was kind of how we always tackled it. Yeah, and that's common with somebody who's managing like a management company who's managing multiple properties. And that's the cool thing about that option that Whitney showed earlier about the management group is that we flagged those questions like having um, like an HR policy or safety training. So you can answer it across the board for multiple properties at once, which saves a lot of time. But I know for an operation that might be smaller, another way that you can get more help, you know, if you're the owner, um, if you're working with a PCA, they can have a lot of knowledge to help you answer a chapter specifically like chapter nine, which is on pest management. Great. Okay. And then as you were going through this chapter, uh, what stuck out to you as maybe the more difficult things to handle? You know, I didn't, I, I, I do think the questions are very timely and I don't necessarily see any huge holes. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, it is funny We'd have to look back at when some of those management enhancements were added because I do think some of them were new because they hit on some things that have become more important over the last couple of years. But I don't, I don't actually, I, I, I wish I could tell you I came up with something that was really a big hole or a big problem, but I, I didn't, I didn't see it. No, that's great to hear. <laughs> yeah, it is good, and that's actually a big part of maintaining the SIP certified program. Is we still have an active technical committee, which Greg was on <laughs> for a really long time, and they get together annually to look over the standards, look at a few chapters, and then review any comments that come in from our membership or the public to make sure that we're constantly improving our program with science and technology, and also to be user friendly. Okay, so should we move on to chapter 11? Sure. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so this one's on social equity. So I actually think I wrote this intro way back when. Uh, I'm guessing it's probably been tuned up since then, but, you know, it's really well written. I gotta say. It's, it's <laughs> we haven't changed the thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I thought, I thought a couple of things as I was reading through this. I, I, I think one thing that you asked in the in the pest control if there was anything that jumped out at me that maybe was hard or that we should think about it. I, I think the 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 preponderance now of H2A labor in ag is different than it was uh 20 years ago when we wrote it and certainly becoming more prominent than it was five years ago or whenever we last reviewed this chapter. I think it's something we need to look at. A lot of the questions really do work even with H2A. 
Um, you can still answer them, but I think probably we need to we need to take a look at that. And then the other thing is, you know, I think I think heat illness has become such a big concern um, in the state of California and elsewhere that we we mention it a couple of times, but I would think we should probably have some sort of management enhancement, um, thinking about the best way to tackle that specific issue. A, a lot of, I, I didn't see, again, I don't want to just say it's a great document in all cases, but I didn't see a ton of things that I thought, you know, were tough or needed to be gotten rid of. I think, I think again, the social equity thing is, is pretty representative of what people are doing, but those are the two things I think you know, H2A and, and heat illness are, are timely topics that we should revisit there. And something to keep in mind too, when you're answering the social equity chapter is that those responses should be across everybody who's working on the property. So if you are using a farm labor contractor, you would be including, you know, your own employee handbook if you have, you know, on-site staff and the farm employer contractors employee handbook as well. You know, the intent is to have good social practices across the board. Excellent. And then this chapter is actually on our um, uh, review list for February with the technical committee. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll make those notes. I'll bring them to them and talk about them. My timing is great to be off that committee, then. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. <sighs> okay, let me scroll through the chapter real quick. Um, yeah, a lot on the employee handbook and safety. I know sometimes for somebody who might be a smaller operation, those can seem like really big standards to tackle, but there's, we actually have a template for an employee handbook, and I know you can find templates for things like that online. So while it might seem kind of daunting to come up with this whole big employee handbook, there's lots and lots of templates out there to make it easy for you. Well, and I think that back to what I was saying about us learning that we were not doing um checking of weeds and stuff in the off season and it being instructive i think the things that we're requesting um will be a good process for companies that don't have that you're going to say at, during that process like hey this was a hole in my business that i've now that i've now fixed so i think that you're going to run into things in this document that i mean we even did in a larger company where we didn't have it but the process of getting it was actually helpful to our business, and I think I think a lot of the social equity stuff is the same way. You're gonna mm -hmm. you you may find something that you don't have, but it's 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 something you should have ultimately. And that's a nice way to approach those management enhancements too. You know, the requirements have to be done to get certified. Management enhancements you need 50% of those points. But where a lot of people get value out of this process is going through these standards. You know, like you said, and learning new ideas. And it's okay if you don't implement every single management enhancement that first year, you can kind of, you know, put that on your list to say, this is something I'm going to work on, implement over the following year, and then you'll be able to, you know, check yes and get the points for it in the future. And I really, do, I, I'm thinking back to something you said, Whitney, about time. When, when the program first started after we wrote it, then we had several years of pilots. Mm -hmm. I forget all the vineyards that were pilot programs. And I think at that time, I was literally the one doing it. And it was a lot of work the first year. And it felt sort of overwhelming. And then once you got through the audit and, you know, you you kind of had everything you needed in a way. And then it was like updating year to year. It was much easier. So I would just encourage people not to get taken down by kind of that overwhelming first year because it's going to be a lot. But then once you kind of get into the annual adjustments and audits, I think it's it's much more manageable. Definitely. Yeah, that's common feedback that we get. And the whole point with the technical committee was to write a program that was, you know, implementable, but also set a high bar for sustainability. So it's something to be really proud of. You know, you're putting that work in to achieve a big goal. Great. Well, I think that about covers chapter 11. So we'll open up for a Q&A and... See if any questions come in. And also remember too, as you're going through the program, like Whitney mentioned at the top, you know, we're here to support you through that process. So definitely reach out to Whitney with any specific questions that you come up to, you know, you can give her the standard, like I'm not sure what to do with 11.2.5 <laughs> and she can help you out and get you some answers. Mm -hmm. And another thing too, of course, is to, you know, try to work on this a little bit you know, at a time. So that way it's not all crammed into like a two week time frame. So if you're just biting it off in little chunks, 
you know, each month, by the time you get ready for your audit in June, you'll um, you'll be really comfortable just to ease right into that audit. I'm pretty sure that's not how I did it, but yeah. I have heard good things about starting ahead. So maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe some other people can do that better. Yeah, give it a shot, see how it goes. <laughs> we did have one person just do it all in two weeks one time. They had a dedicated person that just got it done. It was very impressive. <laughs> All right. Well, it's been a couple minutes, so I guess we'll go ahead and call it. Right. Okay. Yeah. And if any questions come up, feel free to email me. I'm happy to provide resources or answers, anything you guys need. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us, Greg. Thanks, Whitney. Thank you. All right.